Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ and today as promised, I'll be tearing down my Threadripper workstation and rebuilding it as an Unraid server. Now, unlike most of my projects and videos, I don't have a well thought out and scripted plan going into this. I have a rough idea and that consists of tearing this PC down to get all the components I need from it, storing the parts I don't need and rebuilding it with some of the current parts in here and some new stuff, and then installing and setting up the Unraid server. Now, I'm pretty sure this will have to be broken into two videos, the actual hardware build and then the Unraid server software build, if you will, because I wanna take my time with the actual hardware build side of it to explain why I picked the components I did and how it all relates to and works with the Unraid operating system. But first, I really need to get this disassembled because the chassis I'm putting it all back into isn't intended for a motherboard as big as the Asus Zenith Extreme Alpha, so there'll need to be some modification, and I need the motherboard to plan those mods. I'll explain the hows and whys around that when I get to it, but now for time's sake, I think I'll just go with a quick deconstruction montage, and I'm sure just as soon as that's done, I'll have conceived a much better intro and explanation for this video, so if you have no idea what's going on right now, don't worry, neither do I, but we all will just in about 60 seconds. So that was a quick montage for you. For me, it's four days later and I'm a little better organized. I can better explain what this build is and what it isn't. See, some of the most popular home server builds on YouTube, take an old desktop PC you got sitting in the closet, installing a hypervisor like Proxmox or Unraid, spinning up a few containerized apps and boom, you have a new home lab. Those are great guides. This is not that. This isn't an old $500 dusty Optiplex. Even at current used prices, just this motherboard and CPU cost between $1,500 and $2,000. So unlike my typical home office and gaming PC build guides, this isn't a build guide I recommend you duplicate and build yourself. Although all of this is probably a bit outside the price range of most reasonable people, the principles behind the build are what I really wanna highlight as everything could be scaled down. Your old desktop might not be a Threadripper, but you may have a Ryzen 1700X or an i7-8700K desktop you're replacing. You can apply the same principles that I'm gonna cover here to convert that system to a NAS or a home server. More importantly, what I'd like to do is maybe help you plan your next desktop home office or gaming PC build with an end of life plan in mind. See, when I built the workstation I just disassembled over three years ago, I did it knowing this would be its fate after its use as my daily driver workstation was over. This build was already planned back when I built the original PC. So even if you're planning a build today that you'll use for the next five years, I'll be highlighting some things you could consider to help you plan for the five years after that. So what I'm gonna do now is go over all the hardware as I'm assembling the system, then I'll explain how it pertains to my server and how the same principles pertain to scaled down servers. And I'll start with the CPU. This is a second gen Threadripper 2990WX. It's a 32 core 64 thread CPU with a base frequency of three gigahertz and a boost frequency of 4.2 gigahertz. It has 80 megabytes of total cache, 64 PCI lanes and quad channel DDR4 memory with ECC support. It's installed on an Asus Zenith Extreme Alpha X399 motherboard. This motherboard has a ton of features and I'm not gonna go over all of them, just the big ones that pertain to the build. There are four by 16 PCIe slots, plus a by four slot giving a ton of PCIe device support. 
It has both gigabit ethernet and 10 gigabit networking, eight DIMMs to support quad channel memory, up to 128 gigabytes of non-ECC or unbuffered ECC. In these, I'm installing four by 16 gigabyte unbuffered ECC DDR4 3200 memory DIMMs for a total of 64 gigabytes. If this kit works good, I'll pick up a second kit for a total of 128 gigs. There are three M.2 NVMe slots on board, which I'm installing a one terabyte Samsung 970 Evo Pro, which will be part of my storage pool and reserved for application and virtual machine installations, and two on the included DIM.2 riser, which I'm installing two one terabyte Intel 670p NVMe drives, which will be the cache drives. And there are eight SATA six gigabit ports, so enough for the two eight terabyte Western Digital Red Pros and four four terabyte Seagate Ironwolf NAS 3.5 inch hard drives I'll be installing as my storage pool. Finally, I'm cooling the Threadripper with a Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro TR4 dual tower cooler. This is a good spot to pause the build and provide some explanation. Now, the MSRP total of just the parts I've covered so far adds up to over $4,250. However, like I said, you can accomplish the same thing on a much scaled down level. In fact, the minimum requirements just for an Unraid NAS is a 64-bit, 1 gigahertz CPU and 4 gigs of RAM. So if you're just needing a storage server, you can use pretty much anything going back almost 20 years. But let's look at some of the requirement considerations for the entire server environment. The CPU consideration comes down to what types of apps or VMs you intend to run. Servers in general are multi-threaded animals, and if you're running apps that are multi-threaded like Plex or Handbrake, or you want to run multiple VMs, then you want to look at 8, 12, or even 16 core CPUs. While if you just want to run a NAS or maybe a gaming server, you can do that with a CPU with much fewer cores and a better single core performance. Other things to consider is, does it have virtualization support? Now, there are differing levels of virtualization support, but if you're just running virtual desktops or server operating systems, all Ryzen or Intel Core CPUs can do that. Now, Unraid boots from a USB device and then runs completely in RAM, which is why I'm going with error correcting code memory. It isn't necessary, you can use non-ECC memory, you'll just need to regularly reboot your server. And if you're going with an Intel CPU, there's no ECC support until 12th gen, and then you'd still need a W680 motherboard. Which brings me to the motherboard selection. While your CPU may support HVM or IOMMU virtualization and ECC memory, your motherboard will also need to. This is where you may need to look at those features in your motherboard you wouldn't normally consider. Now, most, if not all, modern Intel and AMD motherboards, even the budget chipsets have virtualization support, but you should definitely double check. However, while only Ryzen Threadripper CPUs officially support ECC memory, unbuffered ECC will work with all Ryzen CPUs as long as the motherboard supports it and many of the budget chipsets don't. So again, you may want to look at the Ryzen X series motherboards rather than the B or H series. And again, double check that ECC can be enabled in the BIOS. When this leads me to the memory selection and why I went with ECC because Unraid runs completely in RAM and this server will have extended uptimes, it's important that there are no errors in the data passed back and forth between the memory. Quick explanation without getting too boring and technical, a computer fundamentally sees data as ones and zeros, each one or zero is a bit of data, those bits of data move back and forth between the CPU and RAM. If a one goes in, a one should come out. However, sometimes a one goes in and a zero comes out or vice versa. This is a single bit memory error, or as we informally call it, flipping bits. This can begin happening in hours, days, or months of uptime, depending on the quality and stability of your memory. These errors can lead to data corruption or even system crashes. ECC memory, as the name implies, can detect these single bit errors and correct them. Again, 
You don't need error correcting memory, but a few things to consider if you're using non ECC memory is first, try to avoid consumer memory with high XMP or DOCP compared to its base or JDAC speed. For example, the fancy DDR4 3200 memory I took out of here had a direct overclock profile of 3200 mega transfers per second, but a base out of the box speed of just 2133 mega transfers per second, while this DDR4-3200 has a base of 2666, and the ECC DDR4-3200 RAM I have installed now has a base speed of 3200, so it requires no overclocking. Now, while it is very possible for DOCP and XMP overclock RAM to be very stable, overclocking is something you typically don't wanna do in a server. But regardless if you do enable an XMP profile or not, what you do want to do is run a memory stability test to ensure your memory is in fact running stable at whatever settings you use. And finally, if you do go with non-ECC memory, you want to completely reboot the server on a regular basis. Finally, some other things to consider when choosing a motherboard is both available PCIe and SATA expansion. Now, if you don't have enough SATA connections for all the disk drives you may wanna add, that's okay. You can get a PCIe SATA expansion card that can significantly expand your SATA capacity, but you will need available PCIe slots. And if you wanna add things like graphics cards or 10 gigabit networking, then you'll need to look at whether you need a motherboard with maybe more of the actual PCIe PCI lanes used for physical by 16, by 8, or by 4 slots, and not say extra M.2 NVMe drive slots. But the biggest consideration is the overall quality of the motherboard. A consumer motherboard is typically the first major component to fail in a home server, and in my experience, this is the one area where you just get what you pay for. While the quality of the components or the number of power phases available to the CPU may not be hugely important in a gaming PC, the longer you keep the motherboard in service, the more important it becomes. So if you plan on giving your PC a second life as a server, the motherboard is one of the areas you may want to spend a little more on than you normally would. The other area is the power supply. Now, I haven't introduced the PSU yet, but this is a Corsair HX1200i 80 plus platinum rated 1200 watt fully modular power supply. This is overkill. It was overkill for it when it was a workstation, but it was extremely efficient. The fan never even turned on. And while it is overkill for the server as built today, it gives me loads of headroom to expand as I will be doing. I definitely see this utilizing multiple GPUs in various VMs and applications. So again, when you're planning your build, I recommend looking at the power supply requirements of everything. And after adding the normal 20 to 30%, because you never really want to surpass about 80% of your PSU's capacity, well then step it up to the next higher wattage. So if you were looking at a 650 watt PSU, step it up to a 750. In the end, you'll end up saving. Finally, I replaced the 360 AIO with an air cooler simply for reliability. The AIO was already a few years old as is, but especially a dual fan air cooler is a great choice for a system that will have a 24 seven uptime. That leaves one of the hardest choices I had to make, and that was the enclosure. Now, first, I want a desktop solution because I don't have, nor do I have a place to put a server rack in my house. Now, if you're just building an application server or hypervisor, any case that holds your components will work. If you're going with a storage server, you'll just need to ensure it has room for your drives. And if you're going standard ATX, there are a ton of great options. There are even some great options for my extended ATX board. The Fractal Meshify 2 I took this all out of is and has been an awesome case for all of this, but I had some other criteria. Three main criteria. It has to hold the six drives. It needs to be no bigger than a mid tower case and it needs to be silence focused. And in step to be quiet who sent me their silent base 802. It meets all my criteria. Out of the box, it holds three 3.5 inch drives and is expandable to seven using these floating drive cages 
In its default configuration, it's definitely silence focused with sound damp in front, top and side panels. There are included mesh panels if I ever wanna go more airflow focused. The entire enclosure can even be reconfigured for an inverted build. And it's a mid tower case, which I said wasn't designed for my EATX board, which isn't completely true. It does fit my 27 centimeter wide motherboard, but the board covers the grommeted cable pass throughs. In a typical build, you can then use the adjustable pass throughs in the front of the case to very cleverly manage cables. However, when you fill those slots with drives, like I am, you lose that ability. However, because there is such a huge opening at the top of the motherboard tray, I can feed the ATX and CPU power cables down from there very cleanly. My motherboard also has the 90 degree SATA ports on it. So those do block the bottom slot. So I can't put a drive tray there. Luckily, I only have six drives. The stock cover also had to be removed to fit the SATA cables. So I just 3D printed a flush panel with one of the grommets installed just to keep it looking clean. The case also comes with Silent Wing 2 140 millimeter fans installed. I installed two more, one more intake in the front and one top exhaust. All the fans are connected to the included fan hub, which I will keep to the lowest setting, which with six 140 millimeter fans should provide plenty of airflow while being super quiet. Okay, real quick final components. I will need to directly access the system to initially set it up and then I can go headless. So to do that, I need a GPU you for video output but also because this is a consumer board it actually needs a dpu installed to boot so i could go with something super simple like a gt710 but i'm using a gtx 1660 because eventually i will be utilizing the gpu or the onboard encoder and decoders for hardware transcoding finally because unraid boots from a usb I got this SanDisk Cruiser Fit, and because the rear I.O. on this board can get pretty warm, I got this internal adapter so I can plug the USB directly into the motherboard where it should get plenty of airflow and be safe. That's everything. The build is complete, and for time's sake, as I know this video is getting long, I went ahead and booted it up. I did get a CPU code on the first boot, but after clearing CMOS, I tried again and booted into the UEFI where I could see the CPU and memory were operating as expected, and all of the drives were showing up, so I restarted. Now, the more complex the motherboard, the longer it takes to post, and this one takes forever, but after a minute or so, the system did boot into Windows, as there is a Windows install on the Samsung 970. The SSD I installed. This will of course be overwritten when I install Unraid, but as it did load into Windows, it looks like we're good to go. Now, again, all of this is not where most people are going to start their adventures and home servers. The total retail cost of this is right at about $5,000, but you can use the same principles I've covered here and build a great server for $500 or you can take the info and apply it to your next PC planning for its next life. Now, I still have a lot of work to do to get this server set up, which is actually a quick process, but running the memory stability test takes about 24 hours at least, and I have many terabytes of data to move to the NAS, so be sure to check out part two where I'll cover all of that, which if you're an early viewer will be posted probably about one week from the day I posted this one, if it's been longer than that, then the link will be in the description below. Be sure to subscribe to catch the entire series and like and share this and I'll see you in the next one. But I do have one very crucial task to accomplish before I can call this build complete. The first peel of the first server build on the channel. Now, this is history.